Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie, a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and I'll be presenting our work on building a distributed future system for fine-grained tasks. But first, what exactly is a distributed future? Well, we can think of distributed futures as an extension of the RPC model that makes it simpler to build applications that require parallelism and computing on large data. To motivate distributed futures, I'll walk through a simple RPC program on three processes. We have a driver that invokes the RPCs and two stateless workers that can execute the requests, which I'll call tasks. We'll begin by sending an F task to worker one. Once the worker finishes the task, it sends back the return value. We do the same to compute O2. And then finally, we can send the values back to worker two to compute their sum. Now, obviously this is a really naive way to execute the program and we're not really taking advantage of the workers. The two problems are that there's a lot of unnecessary data movement going on and there's no parallelism in the execution. Distributed features allow the system to manage these functionalities on behalf of the application. First, let's look at data movement. The main issue before was that we had to copy O1 and O2 back to the caller just so that they could be copied into the add RPC. This can get very expensive if O1 and O2 are large. And so many systems get around this by using distributed memory. After executing the first task, instead of sending O1 back to the caller, we can actually just store O1 in memory on the remote node before replying. We can do the same for O2. And now when we call the add RPC, we pass the objects by reference instead of by value. The add RPC still has to fetch O1, but we are able to save a lot of data copies because the caller doesn't have to keep all of the data local. Ideally, we also want the two F tasks to execute in parallel. Many RPC systems support this with futures so that another function can be invoked while a previous result is still pending. In our example, instead of having to wait for the first task to finish, the caller will immediately get back a future that it can use later on to get the value of O1. In the meantime, the caller submits the other F task, which the system can now execute in parallel with the first. The caller can also pass the return futures into the add task before O1 and O2 have even been computed. Then as soon as the values are ready, the system sends the downstream task. Distributed futures combine these two ideas. Now we can execute tasks in parallel and the return futures also act as references to distributed memory. Meanwhile, the system can manage data movement and parallelism for the application. By making the values in distributed memory immutable, we can keep the same semantics as RPC, but support a wider variety of applications. And distributed futures are rising in popularity. Several systems today already implement distributed futures, even if they don't call themselves by that name. These systems target a wide variety of applications from data processing to machine learning. Many of these systems focus on tasks that run in hundreds of milliseconds or more. The common approach is to use a centralized master that coordinates execution. And for fault tolerance, the master stores object lineage or the subgraph of tasks that created an object. And the master re-executes the lineage if an object is lost. The goal of this work is to design a distributed future system that can efficiently support fine-grained tasks that run in milliseconds instead of seconds. The reason is for generality. As an analogy, we can look again to the RPC model. For example, the popular framework gRPC is practical for so many applications because of its low overhead and, and its ability to execute millions of tasks per second. The question that we study here is whether we can do the same for distributed futures and how we can still achieve fault tolerance. By doing so, we can enable new applications of distributed futures, such as in video processing and model surfing. The potential of distributed futures is huge, but realizing this at scale and in the presence of failures is challenging. And to see why, let's consider the example from earlier, where we had a driver that submitted two tasks and then passed their results to an add task. The fundamental problem is that a single value can now be shared by multiple processes. Take O1, for example. This object is referred to by several processes, the driver that specifies how to create and use it, the worker that creates the value, the worker that uses the value, and the physical location of the value. All of these may be distinct and distributed processes. While making the object immutable simplifies the problem, Still, if we want to ensure that a reference holder can always dereference a value, we need to coordinate these processes. To make this concrete, let's think about the requirements for dereferencing a value. At minimum, we need to know where a value is located and whether it's still referenced. Of course, failures complicate things. 
First, we need to be able to detect a failure. And that means that we need to record the location of a task before it starts executing. That way, if a worker dies, we can determine if there were any pending tasks on that worker that need to be re-executed. Second, we need to record each object's lineage or the tasks that were executed to create the object. Similar to existing systems for distributed futures, we can then re-execute this lineage upon a failure to recreate the object. Finally, the system itself has to be fault tolerant, meaning that all of this information must be able to survive failures. Of course, the main challenge is doing all of this without sacrificing latency or throughput. The most popular approach is to use a centralized master, which makes it simple to achieve correctness, but also comes at the cost of performance. And the obvious solution is to decentralize the system, but a naive approach can make failure handling much more complicated. And that brings us to ownership, which is a method of decentralizing the system without complicating coordination. Our key insight is that coordination is only expensive in existing solutions because they don't take advantage of the inherent structure of a distributed futures application. First, task graphs created through distributed futures are inherently hierarchical. In our earlier example, the program itself could have been invoked by a different RPC function, and these function invocations naturally form a tree. Second, although passing a distributed future by reference creates shared state between processes, in most cases, the scope is limited. In our example, the driver only passes O1 and O2 in its local scope, meaning that its parent never sees these values. So by exploiting the inherent application structure, we can decentralize the system without having to coordinate between all processes. We just need to coordinate between the processes that actually share state. In contrast, a centralized master takes the extreme approach of centralizing all system state in one place, no matter which worker created it or which worker will need it in the future. So the idea behind ownership is to instead shard the master across the workers, which are the processes that actually create and share distributed futures. When a worker invokes a task, it owns the return distributed future and essentially acts as a master for just that object. But unlike a centralized master, the runtime overhead is low because we keep all of the metadata local to the worker that's most likely to use that distributed future. We can also scale the system by using nested function calls in the application instead of sharding the master with an application agnostic approach like consistent hashing. Of course, the main challenge is in keeping the system operations as simple as if there were only one master. These operations include failure recovery, especially if an owner dies, memory safety, and handling first-class distributed futures. In this talk, I'll focus on failure recovery. Let's take a look at how this works. Here, we have several worker nodes that each host an object store. The system metadata will be stored at the workers, and we'll use an example where we have task A that submits task B and then passes the return value to task C. First, to schedule B, the owner writes the location of the task before sending B to node two for execution. Once B finishes, the worker stores the return value in distributed memory and responds to X's owner. Next, we schedule C onto worker three. And since C has a reference to B's return value, it also receives the address of X's owner. Now let's say that there's a failure while worker three is trying to dereference X. We'll leave it to X's owner to detect the failure and then to recover the object by re-executing the object's lineage. Of course, we also need to handle the case where X's owner fails while worker three is trying to dereference X. The main challenge here is that we've now lost all of the system metadata that was on worker one. So somehow we need to recover it and finish executing C. To ensure progress, we first clean up all of the state related to X using the cached owner address to detect the failure. And then we rely on the hierarchical nature of the application. So B and C fate shared with A, but eventually A's owner will resubmit A, which in turn resubmits B and C. So we trade off some persistence in exchange for simplicity and lower runtime overhead. And importantly, we don't sacrifice correctness. We implemented ownership in Ray, an open source system for distributed futures. And to show the benefits of ownership, one of our applications was online video processing where we run a video stabilization algorithm over a live stream and measure the time to process each frame. This is a challenging application because tasks are milliseconds long, the data dependencies are complex, and the latency requirement is strict since we want to produce the output at frame rate. 
We can't afford to use batch parallelism. We have to process each frame individually, and so we rely on pipelining to scale out. Compared to a centralized architecture, the latency with ownership is much lower. And that's because each video stream is owned by a different worker. And so we can decentralize the system metadata across the owners and keep metadata rights local. When a task fails, the system recovers by having its owner recreate the task and any of the tasks missing dependencies. And if an owner fails, the system recovers by fate sharing its children and restarting the owner. We can bound re-execution of the owner by using lightweight application level checkpoints. Here's a demo of that application. The algorithm works by computing the difference between sequential frames and then taking a moving average across a window of frames. On the left-hand side, you'll see the original video and the right-hand side is the stabilized version. Now the challenge here is doing all of this in real time since the video on the left simulates a live video stream. Here we inject a failure and the video pauses. But once the system recovers from the failure, the stabilized video can continue. Thus, the key insight behind ownership is to decentralize the system according to the structure of the application. That allows us to achieve transparent recovery and automatic memory management without sacrificing performance. In doing so, we can enable new applications of distributed futures, such as in video processing and model serving. All of our code is open sourced and deployed in live applications today as part of the Ray project. Thank you, and I'll take any questions.